Hey guys, this will be video three for the uh, Flying V build, and uh, I've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's just dive right in. Uh, all right, so you've moved from uh, your construction paper, you're, you're cool with your drawing, now it's time to uh, buy some lumber to, to build your body. So you need to take uh, an X-Acto knife and or your scissors, cut out your template really, really precise. Uh, I mean, just as close as you can get. And typically what I do is I just work from half templates and then I'll create a master template and then I may even take that master template and go straight to a piece of half inch plywood or acrylic. But for the most part, where you're at in your job, you need to be able to take uh, and just cut these out. And if you want, you know, just cut them out rough because you might not work with them and you might change your mind. But at a minimum, uh, cut out two. That way you can go to your lumber store and you can start laying this on a board and you might you might find a board that's really nice and wide but it's you know but it's not really wide enough to do you know the, the, the full body but you might realize that hey man I, I don't have to slide all the way down I could slide up to maybe that point right there by a board that's 10 and a half or 11 by you know I don't know 22 or whatever so uh, paper start with paper pencil and paper and uh and the sky's the limit so what am i going to cover in this video other than templates uh now that i can scratch that up and i'm actually just going to check this off so i can just rock it through this um and then uh the next thing you do you know once you bought your lumber or whatnot you then you then you proceed to build your body and I'll, I'll discuss this briefly in a minute but for the most part i just want to hit the high points as to what i'm going to cover uh, another thing you can do when it comes to your design work and layout, if you've never done this, uh, it might be a really good investment to just, uh, this is a Stuart McDonald uh, acrylic template for a, a 1950s uh, Les Paul that was based on Dan Erlewine's uh, Authentic 59. If you know that what you're building is going to be a traditional guitar and you're going to put the bridge in and you're going to put the tailpiece in and you know you're going to go with a with a uh, I almost said a filter trying but a PAF and a PAF and you know you're just going to stick tra to traditional scale then you could use this universal template to lay out whatever guitar you want to build you, you know c cover this cover these outside perimeter lines up and it's just it's the sky's the limit so you might invest in a nice template like that I don't like the uh, MDF templates just because I think they're cheap, the, and, and they are. They are phys they are uh, monetarily cheap, but they're also physically cheap as well. They just uh, they j I just don't like them. So nonetheless, maybe invest in a good template, and then you can use that to do your building in the future. And I don't know if Stu Max sells uh, uh, the Fender product templates, uh, but I do know that they have an affiliate relationship with uh, Gibson apparently. And they carry a lot of the Gibson stuff. So stewmac.com. I'm not, you know, I'm not affiliated with Stewmac. I've just used them forever, and they're a little bit uh, pricey on most of their items. But from a vocational and educational standpoint, you can go on their website and study their videos and their blogs and their communication. Or the cool thing about Stewmac, send them a question, they'll actually answer it. So cool that you'll get you'll get someone you know, that has been building guitars for 20, 30, 40 years that will actually respond and tell you how you should or should not do something. So it's a great company. And uh, uh, then uh, we're going to talk about tremolos, uh, the, the Floyd Rose versus the Bigsby. And I'm going to go, I'm going to do a deep dive into the Bigsby because I kind of threw the Bigsby under the bus in the first video or maybe the second video. And I didn't do it any justice because for the most part, uh, I, I, that's one of the only hardtail guitars I've built in a long time. And that's my, you know, 58-esque replica. But, uh, and I love it for what it is, but, uh, I'm, I'm a Bigsby guy. Every guitar I've ever built, even all my old jazz guitars, I was putting Bigsby's on them. So, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna resuscitate the Bigsby <laughs> and, uh, I'm gonna show you how you could mount it and how how you can do it in in such a way that it, it should be an incredible success because I know what I'm I did wrong. It's not that I did it wrong. I knew it was, in, I knew what I was doing, but I didn't realize that it wasn't going to be nearly as effective. We'll talk about that stuff in a little while. 
So uh, the next thing will be uh, scales. Did I talk about scales? I think the only thing I'm going to talk about with scales is just there are different scales. And, and are, are they limitless? No, not really. For the most part, there's 24.562, which is what that is. It's a very short scale. I have a vintage 60s Gretsch, 6120, that's that short scale. So the Gretsch and the Gibson have a tendency to run the shorter scale. Then you can jump up to uh, the Dobro scale, which is a 25 inch scale. And if you own a Paul Reed Smith, uh, for the most part, I know all his early uh, guitars, they were the, the Dobro scale. Uh, in other words, Paul Reed Smith is a 25 inch scale. And the little white penguin that you've seen, it's hiding somewhere uh, in the video. I may have shown it in this video, but I've got a little uh, uh, 50s replica penguin that I built based on my 56 silver jet, an authentic 1956 silver jet. And, uh, but I put a 25 inch scale on it and it plays great. And then, then you jump up to the, the big boy scale, which is the 25 and a half inch scale. It's a longer scale. And it's not just a fender scale because Gretsch had used the 25 and a half inch scale on their really big body jazz guitars, like the, the big uh, country club and uh, the white Falcon and all of those big fifties era jazz guitars. Uh, I don't know about D'Angelico and, and I don't know about some of the other guys, but I know a lot of those guys were running the long scale. So I say all of that to say this, uh, the scale changes everything. If you put a 25 and a half inch scale just on a Les Paul body and you mount it at the, the 20, at the 16th fret, uh, it, it's, it's just, it's, it's a hybrid. It's no longer a, an authentic Les Paul. And that's what I meant by if you're going to deviate from a particular historical design, you need to really know why you're doing that and not just grabbing a neck that you want really cheap and, you know, screwing it on to a, to a body. So, uh, so let's do this. Let me get this off the table and I'll just show you this briefly. Uh, scratch that. So check the time, make sure it's rolling. What are we, seven minutes. Basically all this is, is just a little, uh, it's a piece of plywood. I can't really, it's just a piece of half inch plywood with, with a little lift on it. And it allows me to do clamping. And uh, turn it this way so you can see the, and that's a piece of uh, 3 8 inch acrylic. I like it because it lifts everything up and it allows me to do clamping because I've got, excuse me, I've got some clamps that have a really uh, a deep throat reach. Excuse me, uh, I, mean, I just ate breakfast and I can reach up in there really deep and, and you know, maybe, maybe press down, down on a board that's being problematic or trying to trying to raise up or something. But if you've done really fine uh, uh, surfacing work, which is what I meant by, I wouldn't recommend buying a rough board because you might end up getting yourself in trouble uh, if you don't have the machinery and or the uh, knowledge of, of how to surface that. Okay, so that's your surfacing. And then uh, I, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna reel myself in because I don't wanna start getting too technical here. But for the most part, if you've got a, a body roughed out in two different uh, leaves, like the, the base leaf and the, the treble, well, you're going to be gluing the center line, okay? So you have to define that center line, but you have to make certain that uh, which surface is your exposed surface. And this is the top of the guitar, which will get the, 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 the laminate on it. So I'm not too concerned about the visual up here. But uh, that doesn't mean that I'm being lazy about the way I'm machining this because whatever reading I get up here is very close to the reading that I'm going to get on the back. Is it going to be perfect? Hopefully. If it's not perfect, well, then, you know, you can machine it accordingly because you're not going to throw in the towel if something happens and, and you get off a little bit. But basically, uh, let me get this coffee out of the way so I don't knock that off the table. Uh, so basically you would, you would clamp this one down first so it can't move and you've, you've, you've already put your epoxy. I like working with an epoxy. You could use a tight bond here, but this jig that I've got designed here, I don't know if it's sufficient for using tight bond. Probably is because I got an enormous amount of torque on, on that strap. That's just a trailer strap. 
So, but anyway, I tighten that one down a little bit. Well, probably not as tight as you would think, but tight enough to hold it in place. Then I put this one up, slide them together. Uh, I actually do it on the table and then I'm cleaning it with a lacquer thinner. And then I put it up on the table so I won't have a, an excessive amount of squeeze out. Then when I put the strap around here, put your little, put your little strap in loose, but put your little quick grip of some sort to, to hold that strap from falling off as you're, as you're setting everything up. Cause it's very important that you don't have any sort of weird, weird twist or cock or anything. And you want to be, uh, very much centered around the whole body because once you torque this baby, what's really cool is you need to make certain that you are flush at that point, but this strapping force, everything about if these two pieces are near identical, at a minimum identical here, here, and here, very close in their length, then once you start putting the torque on this strap, it'll pull everything into a, tr a trueness. Don't rely on it. And when I put this one, when I'm laying this one on, I only put this clamp up there and that clamp just enough so that when I start torquing it, it doesn't risk trying to lift. It just keeps it under control. And then when I ratchet clamp this together, man, it pulls in and you let it dry overnight. So let's take it apart. I'm gonna just throw these clamps on the floor. I don't ever do this, but. And you can see these are just little uh, discount store uh, clamps. Doesn't have to be your high-end. Uh, Jorgensen's, I believe is the name. Uh, oh, okay, very cool. And you can see uh, this, if this gives you an idea about why you should work with epoxy and how clean your job should be before it goes together. Uh, that is parchment paper, and I love the epoxy and the fact that the, before I put the clamping force on that, I had it pretty much clean so there'd be very minimal squeeze out, but I can reuse that parchment paper. Uh, if you use tight bond, you, you won't be able to reuse it again. Just, you know, piece of acrylic. There's a little stand. So, and it kind of, it's kind of like a little ironing board. I can reach in here and clamp. I should have overhung here as well, but, ah, you know, either here or there. Let's see how it, yeah, it looks nice. Looks really nice. I'm just, I'm concerned about this flushness right here. I'm very happy with that. And what is this? You might be thinking, good God, what is that? <laughs> Contractor grade, <laughs> you know, pine from home depot or lowe's or some big box now this is this is late late 1800s uh, antique pine that is uh, i'll show it in a little while uh it's uh okay it's late 1800s antique pine it's quarter sewn you can see the quarter right there and the tap tone is out of this world and that's why you see a uh, uh, kind of that's uh, not resurgence, but more of this introduction of where these guys are doing the, the pine caster, the telecasters, or primarily telecasters because they'll show the knot and stuff like that. Uh, what most people don't realize, pine is a phenomenal wood for building uh, jazz guitars, even uh, a lot of the, the arch tops for jazz guitars. If you get some really old growth, heart not heart pine but just uh, antique pine that's quarter sewn some of the, some of these grains are insane how tight they are if you know how to carve them they make a phenomenal jazz guitar and i don't mean a 500 dollars jazz guitar i'm talking a multi multi thousand dollar jazz guitar so the tap tones for pine is stellar See how that held that in place for you while you were collecting yourself. And if you're using the epoxy, you got, uh, if you're using a slow dry epoxy, you are not jumping through hoops trying to uh, do your job before the glue starts tacking on you. Okay. See the quarter. We'll talk about tap tones later on because I don't want to waste any time. I only put that tape up there to keep it from epoxying to my, uh, strap okay so that's going to be one of the guitars 
that will be, uh, it'll be paint grade, even though that's a pretty pine. That was some of my initial work that I just wanted to, to show you how, if you can't find a board that's six inches wide, uh, this is, this is authentic. I, I'm going to have to show you where this is from. That's how it started out, and you would look at that and go, that, that's not even worthy of being used as crepe material until you run it through your planer and you see what you've got. Even with that checking, you know, you rough that out and, and alleviate that. Let's see if I can find the tap home. And that's even with the check in it. Unbelievable tap tone, very dense and not nearly as heavy as you would think. Sometimes you'll pick up one, they'll be identical, and you'll pick up one and it'll be 30% heavier. So you just have to work through your wood. But if you've got your own machinery, you can do all your own surface work. And uh, what are we, 16 minutes? I'll try to end this pretty soon. So you can glue them up. And the way I did that is I glued. I glued this little piece here. It was it was still square, so that I was able excuse me able able to clamp it. And uh, that's tight bond. Glued that with tight bond. And if you're working with tight bond, you'll get a beautiful visual joint. Now, if you were doing this stain grade or clear coat, then you could come in here and match. You know, you could you could you could do it so much so that you almost, especially if you had real tight grain like that, you could actually glue glue it up so that you would think it's just one piece. And that's the, uh, sorry, that's the sign of a really, really good woodworker is your ability to look at a rough board, and start surfacing it, and then determine how to glue it together so that most people wouldn't even realize that it's glued up. So let me check the time. 17 minutes. What do I want to talk about? Uh, I don't want to talk about bodies anymore. We'll talk about this stuff in, in enough detail later, but I'll just leave it up on the top. Again, this is this is going to be the sparkle top, so I don't care too much about what's going on up here. But what is critical is that I have a, a perfectly flush surface because if I have the slightest little bit of hump or something, it could show. So. Now, what now? I don't know if I'm going to have time to talk about this. Uh, I keep checking my time because I want to keep these videos under 20 minutes because they upload about five times quicker. And I apologize if I sound like I'm in a hurry because I'm not. But uh, let's talk about uh, Floyd Rose versus the Bigsby versus the Hardtail. We all know about the Gibson ABR1 or the Tunematic or some sort of Hardtail with the adjustable thumb wheels. Not going to go into that, but what I had mentioned in one of the videos uh, starting this series that uh, the cool thing about the, the Flying V is this is this is neither a left hand or a right hand until I cut the control cavity. You know, whether I cut the control cavity on that side or on this side over here. And that doesn't have to be done until after the neck is glued in for the most part. And you would think, most people would think, well, and it, it, for the most part it's true when you set up the routing jig to do a Floyd Rose, it is handed if that item is left in. But you could leave your uh, uh, arm out and this is centered, okay? So you could do your initial, we know the guitar has a top and a back, that's given. So we know that if this is the top, which it's not, this is the back, but humor me here. If this is the top of the guitar, all I have to do is just machine enough just to get this through the body so that I can find my alignment for my studs, et cetera, et cetera. And I could build this guitar up uh, universal. And then if I sold it and it's to a left-handed person, then I could come in and route, you know, over here and then they can put a left hand Bigsby on it. Okay, that's why I love building this guitar. It, it's not defined until you do it. And let's say you put that, uh, wherever it is, that Explorer type, uh, uh, traditional uh, six in line headstock. Well, if it goes left hand, then that headstock is gonna have to become a reversed headstock. 
But if it's the Flying V headstock, it's still universal. And the, until they put the left-hand nut and the left-hand Floyd Rose on there. Okay.